Can leopard geckos live together? And are they even social? Well, we're gonna dive into that topic right now, so let's go. The most famous text is published on leopard geckos living in colonies, so we're gonna start here. This article was posted in 2009 by Dr. Mohammed Sharif Khan, who has both a master's and a PhD in herpetology, who was a professor of zoology at a university in Pakistan. And he's now the director of a herpetology lab, and he's still publishing work on the herpetofauna of Pakistan. So there we go, his credentials are very much established. His paper describes them as being gregarious, aka social, and that they colonise crevices and holes. Several lizards may live in loose colonies in holes in the ground, under stones, and crevices among rocks. A leopard gecko may climb several feet to reach its permanent selected resting place, which it shares with several individuals of different ages. So we know they use the environment more three-dimensionally than a flat terrarium, and he's actually describing them as climbing several feet to sleep together. This description suggests that geckos in the wild are willing to work for something they find rewarding or at least they're extremely motivated by which is actually more important than whether something is natural. Climbing to reach each other could indicate that it's a choice and they want to be together, or it might just be necessity as the only hiding place available to them. Almost all geckos at the site come out as the sun sets and are scattered to forage individually around, returning to the site one by one just before dawn. Now, I find this description particularly interesting. When they're dispersed to hunt at night, why don't individual geckos find their own microclimates to hide in, their own hiding places, away from conspiracy specifics that they might find stressful, why do they choose to travel back to be together? The composition of an Eublotherian colony differs throughout the activity period of the gecko. A pre-breeding colony mostly consists of several subadults and adults. Soon fights among males ensue and scatter them, leaving a dominant male with several females constituting a breeding colony. Now this description seems to align with what we actually see in captivity. Males do in fact display agonistic territorial behaviour towards other males, with either a subordinate male leaving the area or a fight ensuing to establish dominance. A breeding colony of a single male and a group of females is often what many would do in captivity. During the demolition of an old stone wall that was colonised by leopard gecko, I chanced to observe and trace the extent of retreat chambers between stones inside the wall. Several openings lead by narrow vertical and horizontal passages leading into expanded chambers running across the 1.5 feet thickness of the wall. The leopard lizards stay clinging to the walls or sleep at the stony base. A special pocket at the base is reserved as a defecation site into which their feces fail to collect. An egg laying site may be used year after year by the same female or by several females in the colony. It's in a secure resting place regularly used by the geckos. A series of chambers within the brick wall used by the colony is actually mapped out here. The mention of geckos using a communal latrine in the wild also lines up with what happens in captivity. The use of a shared latrine actually suggests a certain level of social intelligence, but also a shared understanding to only defecate in that chamber. Using the sense of other geckos to see where to defecate is a social behaviour that would not have evolved if there was not some sort of evolutionary advantage to that behaviour. Perhaps it mitigates the effects of pathogens and disease by keeping it all in one place. But why would they ever need to evolve this if they only ever lived near each other for short periods of time? This kind of waste management, if you will, suggests that they would actually live near each other for an extended period of time. It's notable that he actually describes females will share egg laying sites. I have actually seen females in stores that I used to work in share a lay box really amicably. In fact, there was way too many geckos in that tank in my opinion, but it wasn't my circus, wasn't my monkeys. Often I would open up a lay box and find many females resting inside. I'd have to remove the females to get to the eggs and there would be a lot of eggs at the bottom of this moss in this lay box. An egg laying box would be the most valuable resource in the world at that moment in time for a gravid gecko. So why didn't a female dominate that egg box and defend it from other females to guard that really valuable resource? Both in the wild and in captivity. So why don't they actually destroy the eggs of the female that laid in there previously? Surely eating a competitor's eggs would replace the vital nutrients that that gecko was going to use in producing her own eggs. We know that other solitary species do so. When leopard geckos shed, they will eat the shed. So they will eat this low nutrition shed to not waste nutrition but they won't eat a competitor's highly nutritious egg. Or even if they attacked another female and got her to drop her tail, then you've got that leopard gecko's fat reserve as a nice healthy treat to replenish everything that you've lost in producing your eggs. It quite literally does not make sense unless you actually consider social behavior. You take 
every opportunity to put yourself ahead as a gravid lizard. Every advantage you can take, you take it. Unless the evolutionary advantage is to not do that. Next, I'd like to show you a paper on spatial orientation of leopard geckos in a maze task. Now, this study actually found that leopard geckos were able to navigate these maze tasks even when markers that are cues to navigate are removed. They actually found that individual geckos were employing different tactics to remember the maze and flexibly adjusted their strategies when different landmarks were removed. So we do know that leopard geckos can take in information about their surroundings and are likely able to spatially map an environment in the wild. So if they have the cognition able to do this when they disperse to hunt in the wild and they can map out the environment why don't they find an alternative site to go to rather than return back to the same one in the same colony? Especially if Lepigecus were solitary and conspecifics were stressful. How likely is it that that rock wall was the only microclimate, the only human microclimate on that whole hillside, on that whole grassland, or any other habitat you want to describe that's within their range? How likely is it that's the only option to them? Yet, they seemingly navigate their way back to familiar geckos that they know. Just to build upon familiar conspecifics, a study found that a male leopard gecko can differentiate between two familiar females. Male courtship behaviour would drop in frequency and latency with a familiar female, but would ramp up and get excited with a new novel female. Now you can imagine this would be advantageous in stopping him from mating with the same female over and over again and work his way around new females. This could be because they have to work their way around the colony and mate with all the females to maximize reproductive success. Recognition of individual females could be an evolutionary advantageous trait due to the high frequency of constant interactions with females in close proximity. Or it could suggest a preference of finding new females to mate with. But then you would think that would mean more roaming from a dominant male. Or perhaps it actually urges on the males that have been banished from colonies to mate with females they come across when these females leave the colonies on their dispersals out into the environment to hunt. In other solitary species, they may not even need to discriminate between more than sex, let alone familiar females in this way. Or it could just be a trait that developed in a common ancestor and actually has no relevance to sociality or colony life whatsoever. Another study on leopard gecko reproduction found that females that mated with more than one male had more clutches, had increased egg fertility and larger eggs than females that mated with one male. And then with females that mated with one male but multiple times fell somewhere in between those two. Well logically it makes sense. It would be advantageous that reproductive success is higher when outbreeding occurs. Those females that dispersed from colonies may mate with males that do not have a group of their own females. This would actually add genetic diversity to a colony and add genetics to a group that would otherwise probably suffer from inbreeding. It reminds me of the cuttlefish scenario where you have a dominant male that will protect females but then you have a subordinate male that actually present himself as female and sneak in and mate with the females. Now that actually adds genetic diversity to the actual pool of cuttlefish but they still have dominant males but then subordinate males will still mate with females. It's A and B not A or B. However this is only speculation on my part because we don't really know enough. Additionally more sperm received by a female in multiple matings just means more sperm to use. This explains why multiple pairings with the same male is better than one pairing of that single male. I don't really think this is evidence for or against social groupings, but rather it signifies that we don't know enough about gecko dispersals and social networks in the wild. Another study found that leopard geckos would look to where another gecko was looking to see what that gecko was looking at. Now this is called gaze following. Gaze following is advantageous in species where individuals regularly interact. It also indicates a higher level of social intelligence that has only really previously been heavily studied in things like mammals and birds. Birds. Gaze following in a social species can reveal utilizable knowledge about another individual's future intentions. Being sensitive to another animal's gaze can actually help with foraging or help them detect predators far earlier than they would on their own. Again, many species have been shown to do gaze following because of the many frequent interactions with members of their own social species. However, there is the argument that gaze following is likely basal and it actually evolved in ancient amniote ancestors and is present in many species solitary or social. So following on from leopard geckos looking at each other, there was a study on UV reflectance in leopard geckos. They were looking to see whether UV reflectance was used as a means of complex visual communication among leopard geckos. They found that the geckos had high UV reflectance of areas of low pigmentation or high whites. And this could have evolved as a complex anti-predatory mechanism 
or it evolved as a social communication mechanism to other geckos, whether that be mate choice or simple recognition of individuals. Could there be more to UV reflectance in social communication in leopard geckos? We do know that the tail is heavily used to communicate between leopard geckos, whether that be slow tail wags or vibrant tail rattles from males. So it does seem logical that UV reflectance on the tail would be a contextual part of that communication. But how does the wild translate to captivity? Do people keep these leopard geckos together? Well, yes, many breeders for decades have kept leopard gecko females together and have rotated in males between groups. It's also very common in reptile stores here in the UK to house leopard geckos together. I mean, I've worked in ones that do just that and many hobbyists also cohabitate leopard geckos. The British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquariums, aka Biaza, has recommendations for its members on how to cohabitate leopard geckos. And their guidance says that large enclosures can house female leopard geckos together, but with only one male per enclosure, as males are aggressively territorial. If subordinates are bullied, they may need to be housed separately. And this guidance actually seems proportional to the groupings found in the wild by Dr. Khan in Pakistan. However, there are many leopard gecko keepers that actually oppose keeping them together and expect cohabitation to result in injuries or even death and believe zero risk is essential by keeping a leopard gecko solitary. So let's examine some arguments for and against. You could argue that since they're social in the wild, keeping them solitary in captivity means that they have a large part of their behavioural repertoire basically denied to them. And you could argue that what is the difference between an animal that's pushed out of its social group and disperses out into the wild versus a keeper noticing that happen in their vivarium and separating that gecko. Now a counter argument to that would be that leopard gecko activity peaks during the nocturnal hours so it would be normally when a keeper is sleeping and therefore unable to intervene at the right moment should it happen when they're asleep. So you'd be putting them at more risk by putting them in an environment that they can't actually escape from. You could argue that colonies in the wild does not translate to vivariums because a vivarium is inherently an enclosed space. An enclosed space that actually a leopard gecko can be cornered in. But then again, a vivarium can be much larger than the holes and crevices within a brick wall that's only 1.5 feet deep. And that a small dead end chamber in one of these walls is more packed in and enclosed to be cornered in than a vivarium. You could argue that even females have been recorded in captivity, fighting and squabbling and injuring each other. So they can't truly be a social species. But then again, so are rabbits, rats, guinea pigs. But rabbits will gouge each other's eyes out and kill each other and rats will chew tails and even kill each other. In some European countries, it's against the law to keep a rat or a rabbit alone because it puts them in a low welfare state to be in solitary confinement. Dogs can be dog aggressive and straight up murderous, but yet we know they're a social species. Being a social species does not mean the absolute absence of conflict. You could argue that in the wild they do not need to compete for basking spots, food, hides or even egg laying spots and in vivariums it's limited and in captivity a dominant gecko can monopolize these resources. However you could argue that a big enough enclosure could offer multiple hides, multiple basking spots, enough food and have more than enough to compensate. If you have more than one resource for every gecko then it's impossible to monopolize it by sheer maths. If you had an egg laying site for every female and they still choose to pile in and be together, then isn't that a choice? Now I could go on forever, but the point I'm trying to make is that it's an incredibly gray area and complex and certainly isn't black and white as people want to make it out to be. But then why do some geckos fight and some do not? Well, some little things can be explained by people co-having two females that they think are female but are actually male and then they post on the internet their females fight or beginners having completely incorrect care that actually exasperates issues and acts as a catalyst for conflict. A great many examples are probably likely due to husbandry error and I think many people cover that already so I would like to dive into the nuanced areas here. There are so many papers on temperature-based sex determination in leopard geckos with differing incubation temperatures producing females females with different hormonal profiles. Females that were incubated warmer had elevated levels of testosterone compared to other females, making them appear more masculine and less attractive to males, but more dominant to other females. Another paper actually removed the chemical cues that a male will use to identify a female conspecific. And what happened was the male couldn't figure out whether it was male or female and acted aggressively. So what if increased levels of testosterone in masculine females actually causes them to be attacked by males and causes them to initiate conflict with other females. Well, that's exactly what happened in another study where females were surgically implanted with testosterone. The females actually acted with male traits such as tail rattling and were attacked by the real males. We already know that keepers recommend 
using clutch mates and cavitation setups because they seem to be the most successful. Now, could a major part of that be because they're actually incubated at the same temperature? And that temperature might have been low enough that it doesn't increase testosterone in those females? Let's even go back to the UV reflectance. Most geckos are trichromatic, meaning their eyes have three cones, with differing sensitivities in UVA, blues and greens. Each of these cones needs to be stimulated by light in natural proportions for them to even see white light. So unless a leopard gecko has UV, they won't be able to see each other's UV reflectance. Now how does that play into how leopard geckos interpret each other? Reflectance was highest in areas of least pigment, so what about morphs? Do the morphs that reduce pigment and make really high white leopard geckos make them light up like a Christmas tree? Is that alarming to other leopard geckos? Or the reverse, the really dark ones that have very little UV reflectance, is that alarming? We don't know what this means. If a leopard gecko is raised in isolation, does it struggle socially? Do they make other leopard geckos uncomfortable because they behave atypically? Or are they uncomfortable because they can't read normal behavior in other leopard geckos? But can cohabitation actually be beneficial? I would say yes if they gain reassurance from other geckos, or if sleeping together helps with thigmotaxis or even thermoregulation, we know that in turtles they pile up on top of each other, not because they're competing for the sun, but because it actually helps both of them with thermoregulation. We just don't know enough. If the geckos have many resources of equal value, then they can't be monopolized by one individual, and they still seek each other out, isn't that a choice? Then if that's a choice they've made, do you not think there's more to it than that? I would cohab leopard geckos and I probably will in the future. I'd be very comfortable with a 1.2 or 1.3 in one of my big seven foots behind me. But do I think we should recommend it to beginners? No. I don't, because it's an advanced concept that requires more money, more space for spare enclosures, if you need to separate, the money for vet bills, if something does indeed go wrong, and also because it relies on the keeper's ability to read the dynamics of that group and read the behaviors of those geckos. And if you haven't earned your stripes and you aren't keyed into that, then you can make mistakes. We know that stenos or even scorpion geckos are social, but even scorpion geckos have been reported to injure each other. But the number of injuries that are reported are small by comparison, and beginners might not even know what these species are or even that they exist, or they're just more attractive to seasoned hobbyists. In an alternative universe where scorpion geckos and leopard gecko situations were flipped, and scorpion geckos were available, widely available to beginners, and they were the common species, and leopard geckos were in fact this expensive gecko that's just entered the hobby. I would bet that seasoned advanced keepers would keep the leopard geckos socially and we would all be like yeah leopard geckos are social but don't keep scorpion geckos together. Availability of a species equals more husbandry errors by default. The evidence points towards leopard geckos truly being a social species and I truly believe that. We just don't know enough about them to talk in absolutes so don't denigrate or attack people who choose to cavitate and don't judge people who are really uncomfortable with it. We just don't know enough to talk in hard lines here. Dogma is the enemy of progress.